Good, תסגרו לי דלת. Good afternoon, good, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to some of you. Uh, I'm Sarit Zavi from the Alma Center here in northern Israel, uh, 12 kilometers or 13 kilometers from the Lebanese border. Uh, I wanted to update you on what's going on uh, in this war that started uh, 10 decades ago. 10, 10 days ago, I'm sorry, very little sleep in the past two days. Uh, so maybe I should uh, start with uh, this kind of disclaimer. Uh, excuse me if my, my eyes are not watching you and I'm looking at the other side to see the updates that are coming in all the time. And excuse me if my wording is not as you are used for me, I guess all of you know me, uh, because uh, we get very little sleep and we are extremely worried. And um, <clears throat> I want to start from uh, the update specifically of how the situation looks like here uh, in the past uh, day or few days up north. And I'll do that in a minute because I see people are still getting in. Uh, you are all invited to ask questions in the Q&A. I will do my best to answer them. And again, my apology if it's not 100% fluent as we are used to because uh, I can't scan in English. It takes me a little while to read the questions and answer them, but I will try to answer all of your questions. And I have, I have time for that. We see people are still joining in, so I wait another minute until we restart. And again, you are all invited to ask questions uh, around that. And uh, meanwhile, I will say, uh, I will send a um, uh, prayer to the hostages uh, in Gaza uh, from uh, various nationalities, not only Israeli citizens, And we'll get started in a minute. I'll see that people are uh, still getting in. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So uh, let's start from the picture as it is today. Since this war against the state of Israel had started, we have above 1,400 who were murdered, or should I say slaughtered. We have 3,500 wounded various ways, treated in the Israeli hospitals. We have above 200 hostages confirmed, kidnapped to Gaza, and among the murdered and, and the missing, we have still missing people that we didn't confirm they were hostages and we didn't find their bodies. Uh, we have around 150 murdered and 140 missing that have uh, another citizenship that are not only Israeli citizens or just foreign citizens. Yeah. Um, IDF is fighting in Gaza. Everybody's talking on preparation to ground invasion to Gaza. I truly don't know. I try not to follow all these uh, reports about the IDF plans, military plans, because you may understand that the IDF is not revealing the exact, exact military plan. I can say, I did, can talk about the goals. And the goals are two. One is to eliminate the military capabilities of Hamas, and the other one is to release the hostages. We also see uh, an effort by the United States to bring to either humanitarian ceasefire or some kind of arrangement that will enable uh, the release of the hostages. To tell you the truth, I don't know where this is leading. I see my enemy and I see how they are playing games. And I'm very much worried that uh, what may happen is that the civilian hostages 
maybe I, I hope the civilian hostages would be released, yeah. but I'm worried that what will happen is that the soldiers will not be released. And in Israel, soldiers are everybody. Their mission is to defend us. That's correct. The mission of the soldiers is to defend the civilians. But uh, on the other hand, soldiers are our sons and daughters and husbands and sisters. And everybody knows a soldier that lost his life in this war. Um, IDF has success when we speak about killing Hamas commanders. Uh, every two hours we hear about more Hamas commanders that were killed in this campaign. We publish this information in Alma's uh, platforms, website, or Twitter, so you can follow there. I don't want to get to all the details about the IDF attacks. I want to focus on the north. You see the northern border uh, in my background. This is where I am. The atmosphere in Israel is an atmosphere of war zone. Is an atmosphere. Children are not going to school all over Israel, and everybody is mobilized to this war. It means that those who are not drafted, 360, 100 were drafted. Those who are not drafted are supporting the campaign, yeah. either with um, assistance, I can say, we are cooking the food for the soldiers, they take shower at our homes, we are providing them with the underwears and equipment, and uh, everybody is here for the soldiers, and I can tell you that up north, the soldiers are here to protect us in our communities. And it makes me feel safer, but not completely safe. But uh, we support them completely. All of us support them completely. People volunteer to everything to be part of this campaign, not only supporting the soldiers, but also for the rescue forces, for the hospitals, uh, to take care of the children that their parents are uh, recruited, uh, or working in the hospitals. Everybody here is doing something to contribute to the effort because we all feel that this campaign is life and death to the Israeli state. Not because of the operational threat that Hamas poses. I truly believe that if we just look at Hamas, with all the catastrophe that happened, when we speak in pure military terms, we can deal with it. But the problem is that this campaign is not within Hamas and the state of Israel. It's something greater. This campaign is completely according to a plan. While the mastermind is Iran, it was engineered by the Iranian foreign minister and the commander of Quds Force uh, from IRGC, along with Hezbollah's uh, Secretary General Nasrallah. Uh, I analyzed the meeting between them uh, and Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and I saw exactly uh, how the process of plan confirmation uh, was made. This is according to an Iranian uh, vision to carry out a plan. It published its vision. Nothing was a secret of creating a multi-front campaign against the state of Israel from Gaza, from Lebanon, from West Bank, from inside Israel, from Iraq, from Syria, and from Yemen. They build proxy militias with these capabilities. But they said very clear, clearly that they are going to do that. And they even published the offensive plan of how they are going to do that. We have tons of materials here in Israel around that. The only thing that we missed because we focus in the North is the decision to start from the South. I don't know what Israeli intelligence missed exactly. This will be figured out after the war. But I can tell you that the grand plan was in the air. We knew about it. The IDF knew about it and talked about it. But we didn't know where and we didn't know when. And my main conclusion when we speak about the Israeli strategy is that no physical barrier can prevent mass invasion into the state of Israel. We've seen this in 73. And we've seen this now. We thought the defense and the war and all these measures on the Gazian border are effective, and it's not effective against a massive campaign. It's effective against a, 
and squad here and there, terrorist attacks, not what we experienced. And it's the same problem up north. And that's why IDF is fully prepared up north to meet the invasion of Hezbollah, which brings me to the north. Let's talk about it for a moment because I am uh, being interviewed and I hear the experts in the studios in Hebrew and in English and the leadership. And I must tell you that I'm, I'm worried because what I see is a paradigm. Yeah. I see a paradigm that uh, everybody saw how the United States stands with us and immediately concluded that Iran is deterred. And I'm not sure this is the case. I'm not sure. I wish I'm wrong, but I'm not sure. What I see is that the Iranian foreign minister continues to travel all over the Middle East and spread threats that this will expand to a regional conflict, that Iran will uh, send its uh, Hezbollah to uh, join in if Israel will continue, not even ground forces, if Israel will just continue the violence, I'm quoting from an article I just saw before coming to, to speak to you. Uh, I see uh, what is happening on my border. Every day, there are attacks on my border that in a regular situation that nothing is happening in the South, Israel would uh, respond completely different. Every day we hear either missiles or anti-tank or infiltration or UAVs all the way to Haifa. Every day something happens. Today, for example, there was an attack of Hezbollah. They claimed responsibility. They, don't, they didn't even just you know, give it to Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Every day, and today it was a Hezbollah that launched a missiles to IDF, five IDF positions. I, I heard the IDF retaliation from here, not far from where I live, and the border. Yesterday, there, was a, there were rockets to Naria, and there were anti-tanks uh, in the upper galley. And... Uh, you know, so many reports that I can't even confirm all of them, so I don't want to share all the reports that I got about the, the attacks. But every day, at least two yeah. or one, and something is happening. Uh, today, first thing in the morning, we wake up to an IDF announcement that it is evacuating 28 communities from the borderline. This is 24 thousand Israelis. Those who are living zero to two kilometers from the borderline were evacuated by the IDF. Now, I must say, they, most of them left at the first few days because the mayors warned them to leave. But today it, it became official. It means they will get support of the government and tells and all the logistic support when you evacuate the population. By the way, in the south as well, as the road was evacuated, it's a town of 30,000 people. Um, the Lebanese are speaking in two voices. The Lebanese are on the one hand, you hear Hezbollah continue to threat that if the violence in Gaza will continue, it will join the war. And the Lebanese uh, government and, and other you know, politicians are saying Lebanon is not interested. In it. But it's a, it's a game. Eventually, here is my evaluation around the Northern Arena. And as I've said, I, I am not sure everybody agree with me. I'm pretty sure everybody not. I don't think there is deterrence. I lost confidence in putting my security with the term deterrence. I believe that we are dealing with Iranian Ayatollahs. They don't care about the cost of lives. And if I'm looking at the war in Ukraine, I understand we can understand that even better because the Russians had so many losses and they don't stop. They tactically withdraw, but they didn't stop the war. I think the Iranians are the same. They don't care how many Palestinians will get killed. They don't care how many Lebanese will get killed. And I'm not even sure they care how many Iranians will get killed because they are killing Iranians by themselves anyway. And they got to the point that I was afraid of all these years, that they believe that they can annihilate the state of Israel, that they are prepared militarily, 
that uh, that Israel is weak enough, and they are not positive that the United States will actually participate in a military maneuver. And that's why I don't trust the Tehrans. Now, the US carrier that was sent here is extremely important, but it's important not because it already created the Tehrans, because as I've said, I'm not sure it did. It's important because first it encouraged us and gave us a lot of hope that we are not alone and that we are going and we shall prevail. And second, because there is now operational preparedness to help us protect ourselves. But I don't think it's about deterrence. I believe that the reason that Hezbollah didn't do what Hamas do is because Hezbollah is a little bit different from Hamas. And Hezbollah wanted to create an impression inside Lebanon that he is not the one to be blamed. It's Israel. But he is interested in war. He's playing a double game. And what Hezbollah is doing is trying to drag Israel into war. And I came to the conclusion that the, the logic yeah. or the, the tactic to try to drag Israel into war didn't start on October 7th. Actually, Alma Center published tons of articles in the past year that Hezbollah is trying to drag Israel into war, that Hezbollah is prepared for war. We saw the military operatives of Hezbollah on the border uh, every day. Only in the past few months, there were hundreds of crossings back and forth, not the crossings of refugees or immigration, or I don't know what, Hezbollah military operatives touching the fence back and forth. This is from the UN report. Why did they do that? because they wanted to test the fence and the security measures along the fence. They were operationally preparing the invasion, but they decided in opposed to Hamas that they need a legitimacy. Hamas probably didn't care, I don't know what, or receive the orders. And that's why they didn't initiate the massive campaign that they planned and they were prepared for, but they tried to drag us to attack Lebanon. And then they yeah. retaliated they did that in Passover, 36 rockets were launched to the Galilee, and they planted a tent south to the Blue Line, and they sent an infiltrator with explosives, and so many things happened, and Israel was not playing the game of Hezbollah, which is good. Eventually, eventually, the Iranians lost their patience, and the Iranian uh, foreign minister that visited Saudi Arabia met with the Saudi foreign minister, and MBS, and what he heard from them is that Saudi Arabia is about to normalize its relationship with Israel, and this was the point that Iran said, okay, 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 we have to go. We have to open the campaign against the state of Israel and stop the normalization process. We are operationally prepared, and we are facing a dangerous strategic development, I'm talking on behalf of the Iranians now, of course, a strategic development here in the Middle East. These two contradicted Trends brought us to the timing that I'm talking about. And now Hezbollah is interested to drag us into war. Now, you know, I'm an Israeli. I live up north. And I'm extremely worried because when I wake up in the morning, I say, I don't want the catastrophe. Here. Even if the IDF is fully prepared, it is clear that thousands of rockets will be launched every day to the Galilee and all over Israel. It is clear that they will send their ground forces the same like those of Hamas, but uh, th those of Hezbollah are not only trained, they are also experienced by the battles in Syria. It is clear yeah. that uh, Iron Dome and other aerial systems, and I know there were a lot of rumors about the laser, I couldn't confirm that the laser is operational and is already active. If anybody of you have something, uh, for me, I would love to. I couldn't confirm that. Uh, but I know that these aerial systems, whatever they are, are not 100% protecting me. And now what do I do? When do I evacuate my kids? Because I evacuated them last week and I brought them back because they, they miss home. And now I, I want to evacuate them again. What, what, what would, would I do? I'm, I'm talking as a mother now. What would I do? 
And this is the question that everybody here asks. Should we sleep in the shelters? At home, I don't have a shelter that I can sleep in, by the way. Should I, what, what should we do? Yeah. All of us ask here the same question. And at the same time, we ask a different question. What if there won't be an escalation in the North? Are we rescued? They're not. Because if there won't be an escalation of war, it will happen after the reserves will be uh, released and after the US carrier will go back home. And again, the, there is no barrier that can protect us except for recruiting reserves. What if we will be surprised again? The catastrophe you've seen in the South will repeat itself in the North. So I'm worried from both scenarios. And I don't know which one to, to hope for. Um, I think I can stop here and ask the questions. I see there are many. So let's take a look now. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, Uh, there is a question six, senior commanders eliminated. Please uh, talk about that. Um, guys, six uh, senior commanders eliminated. Uh, it's a very good achievement. It is very important. But for me as an Israeli, as long as the fire continues uh, and as long as the engineers, which is Sinwar and Hania, which is outside of Gaza, and uh, their deputies are in, uh, were not killed, and they're still alive. And as long as uh, nobody is talking with us about releasing all hostages, soldiers and uh, civilians, I, I don't think that this achievement is enough. We don't, we see a little bit of um, decrease in the amount of rockets launching, but I'm saying that very carefully because we don't, I don't have all the information. IDF doesn't publish the information of how many rockets were, were, rockets were launched every day. So it's just an impression. There was a barrage today to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. I can say that before the war, the evaluations that were published of the amount of rockets in Gaza were of about 20,000 rockets. Were these evaluations correct? I'm not sure anymore. By the way, Hezbollah has 10 times more around 200,000. So again, is there a grand plan for multi-front war? Yes. Why is it not like 73? I'm not sure I know, but my suspicion, my suspect is that, or the explanation that I suggest is that the reason that it was not an attack on both sides is because Hezbollah needed the legitimacy and it didn't agree to carry out the surprise attack, initiate an attack, like Hamas. Maybe I'm wrong, it's just an evaluation. There are many questions around that. Uh, and in this respect, it's uh, we are lucky that it, they, they didn't attack from both sides and now the IDF is much more prepared. Yet, for all of us, it is clear the two fronts were in Israel, is a challenge. I'm moving to the next question. So somebody is saying, are there uh, credible direct actions the US could take to, to constrain Iran and therefore uh, limit Hezbollah's action? And could that provide an opportunity for preemptive action for Israel. I don't want to talk about preemptive action, but I can say again that uh, in the corridors where our policy makers are discussing this, I am sure that what is being discussed is what is the point that United States will, as you said, did, when United States will actually open fire. I heard yesterday that for this to happen, you need an approval of your Congress. So it will be out there in the open. Uh, I think that there should be a few points around it. First, yes, opening another front against the state of Israel. I hope the US will be involved in that way or another. 
to help us cope with the advanced capabilities of Hezbollah, and definitely if it's more than two fronts. Second, what if Iran itself will be involved? Third, what about the nuclear program? Let all of us not forget that while we are fighting here, somebody's working very hard over there to progress with the nuclear program. So intelligence agencies must, must make sure that we know uh, whether th that we have the information, we have the intelligence of uh, when we get to the point that we can we, we can take this risk anymore because we understand that we are dealing again with, with an ideology that wants to annihilate the state of Israel now. The moment it is capable to. Some Israelis demand immediately to uh, focus on the north. I think in any case, okay, even if the IDF will decide to focus on the north, first we must gain an achievement in the south. We must finish burying the dead. Uh, there are a few things that should, should happen in the south before Israel will initiate something. And yet again, I'm saying all of that very carefully because I'm not familiar with the IDF plans. And I don't know, I don't know whether I'm going every day I go to sleep, I can't sleep. And I I don't know to which reality I will wake up. I can tell you that yesterday I was very much worried because we saw indications that Hezbollah is destroying the cameras on the border, which are monitoring this invasion. Now, instead of cameras, we can have uh, drones. But you understand that the idea is to blind us. Uh, and it can also be an indication to, to what Hezbollah is planning. What can you do in the US to help? So many things, so many things. How, how, how much time do you have? Uh, first and foremost, uh, complete you the help that you sent, whether military or financially, with a lot of NGOs that are supporting us. We highly appreciate that. We are aware of that. And it's highly important, all of it. Second, help us in the international arena, whether it's the UN or elsewhere. When I watch the news that are coming from CNN and other channels, and I participate in different forums, I see that sometimes there is lack of understanding that this is, this is like World War II, everything I've just discussed. And we need your help. We need your help to make people understand that Israel should not be held accountable for the death of these poor Gazians. It's Hamas that should be held accountable. And that's why all of us should fight Hamas. You know, um, even when we look at Egypt, we should be partners, Egypt and Jordan. They are very much worried from a protest and deterioration in their own countries and I'm totally connect to that. But on the other hand, if Hamas is not destroyed and a clear message is not sent to Iran, after Iran will finish with us, that we are in order. Either if you survive or not, I, I believe you will. Iran will go after the Sunnis. That's the real campaign. That's the biggest campaign, not Israel. And I think Egypt and Jordan and Saudi Arabia understand it. And deep in their heart, they want us to eliminate the threat. But we need their help. We need their help to stop the narrative that says that Israel is killing Gazians. It's not Israel that is killing Gazians. It's Hamas that is killing Gazians. It's Hamas that is using them as human shield. It's Hamas that is blocking their way from evacuation when we call them to leave the war zones. We, IDF published proofs for that. It's not Israel. Yes, the recording will be available afterwards. <clears throat> Uh, would Israel be able to repeal a large-scale rocket attack from Hezbollah? Are there concerns about specific vulnerable targets in Israel, uh, like nuclear power plants or other uh, electricity assets? Yes, look, in 2017, Nasrallah published an interview where he presented a map of the state of Israel, and he said, that's the north, not too many people. This is the south, not too many people. This is the center of Israel. This is where all the civilian infrastructure of the state of Israel. He pointed at the hospitals, he pointed at the Knesset, he pointed at the malls, he pointed at the uh, power plants, he pointed at the wa water desalination, uh, banks, uh, all civilian infrastructures of the state of Israel that you can think of. And he said, that, and then he said, Hezbollah has missiles that can get to these places. So I'm worried, of course I'm worried. 
that's why we have all these uh, aerial systems and uh, defense systems that I've mentioned. And as I've said, it's not 100% uh, success. And uh, a front with Hezbollah is different than a front with Hamas, even though looking at all these atrocities, it's different with regard to the amount of fire that we are going to get from Lebanon. This is going to be the catastrophe, the amount of fire. Why did Israelis predict the entry of, of Saudi Arabia in Aram Accord so early? And did they know Iran would react somehow? Uh, I don't know what Israelis knew. I can tell you what I know. I don't know what intelligence knew, and there will be an investigation whether it was a failure with intelligence, I'm sure. Uh, I don't know what we knew before. <clears throat> Does uh, Israel have enough Iron Dome to counter uh, Hezbollah attack? Uh, I believe that the United States is here uh, exactly uh, the same page with us in this. And the assistance that is being sent by the United States is also around this. And when we speak about these scales, it is never enough. Uh, what can I say? We are all aware of the damage that we're going to have. How strongly the response of uh, Israel to Hezbollah rockets limited, very limited. Until now, it was it was very um how should I say, encouraging for me to see the videos of Hezbollah watching towers on the border that were watching me each, each time I was on the border. Uh, it was very encouraging to see these towers collapse by the IDF um, fire. But uh, in general, the Israeli response to, to Hezbollah rockets and all these attacks from Lebanon was very limited and not provoking, uh, not even um, eliminating the capability and everything was in order to at least postpone the development of another front against Hezbollah. But yes, it is, seems like they are joining Hamas. Um, if the United States is not actively involved in, in the military in the current situation, why is it encouraging for you uh, if it if it will not be involved in a situation that will be in two front war and we're going to bleed? Uh, it will not be encouraging anymore. Israelis will go to the streets and ask for help and ask for the United States to get involved. Uh, now it's encouraging because we understand that we are not alone and it's really 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 important for us. The assistance that the United States sent. The declarations that went out of the US administration were highly, highly important for the Israelis. On the other hand, unfortunately, it misled many Israelis to believe that Iran is deterred without any proof for that. I'm still looking for proof that Iran is deterred and I haven't found any. But it is encouraging for us to know that we are not alone. Um, what other countries, uh, except for the U.S., do uh, in terms of deterring Iran? I don't know about deterring Iran, but with the international arena, we need your help. I don't need to hear now the U.N. denouncing the state of Israel for what is happening in Gaza. I'm sorry. The U.N. should denounce Hamas for what is happening in Gaza. The U.N. should denounce Hamas for keeping 200 hostages. The UN should denounce Hamas for slaughtering my people and not denouncing Israel for trying to fight Hamas that is oppressing his own people in the past 20 years. PR, somebody is asking about PR in the UK and elsewhere in the world. I wanted to say something about PR. Uh, in previous conflict, it was said in Israel that we are very bad in PR. It was said that uh, we don't have a PR department in the Israeli government. 
uh, that it's not uh, that Israel, nobody is functioning here in Israel in the PR. And Sarit, why are you doing what you're doing if the Israeli government should do that? And I have a little bit of a different point of view. I think most of the PR should be done by non-governmental organizations like us. And I know it is being done. I think the government should provide information. I'll give you an example. I saw interviews in the international media that Israel blo blocked the way to Rafiach border crossing. Now it was closed anyway, but <laughs> it blocked the way to Rafiach border crossing and that's why it was not open. I truly, I, I don't know. I don't know what, what, what to answer that. And I tried to ask and I didn't get the answer yet. I believe I will get the answer eventually. Maybe, maybe there was launching from these areas and that's why they were bombed, I, I assume. But I don't know. Uh, this is something that it is important to get the information for us from the Israeli government, but actually to spread the word. All of you can spread the word. And then I'll give you another example. Until today, I myself never published horror videos of uh, is slaughtered Israelis. Uh, and we had them. And I never did that. I thought it's disrespect for the dead Israelis. I thought it's por pornography of the dead. But I changed my mind because I see what is happening in the media. I see that there are denies of what happened. They say we are lying, that nothing happened, nobody was slaughtered, it was just a party over there in the South. And I, and I started to publish the proofs. And it's not easy for me, but I decided to do that. And many organizations decided to do that. So PR, full power, because there are many, there are more than us in the social media. We are fewer than them. Invest all you can to send the proofs to what happened and to uh, undermine the narrative that Israel is responsible for the death of Gazians. Hamas is responsible. And Gazians know that. Many of them hate Hamas because it oppressed them. Um, Again, how important it is for Israel to have a high level of international support at the moment, extremely, extremely important. This goes with the practical level and with the psychological level. If we feel that we are alone in here, if we feel that the, the world doesn't understand that this is not a war between Israel and Hamas. I was asked by uh, one of the reporters, do I still believe in the two-state solution? What, what's the connection between the two-state solution and everything that is happening now? Like, why are we discussing solutions, a, a national solutions? What, what we see here is a campaign of a radical ideology that wants to annihilate the state of Israel and then to annihilate Western values against the West. Okay, this is what it's all about. And I'm telling to all of you, I know most of you are not Israelis, if we will not win this, it will be at your homes because the Iranians are building centers, educational centers everywhere, everywhere, okay? Everywhere from all these countries here, everywhere. And these are educational centers, innocent civilian educational centers. But what do they educate? The distribution of the values of the Islamic revolution. And these children that today are just children educated according to these values, will be mobilized to terror in the future. And you need to shut down these centers. If these children need education, provide them Western education. Don't enable this uh, radical poisoning ideology to uh, uh, prosper in your countries. This is the, the, the thing that you must do tomorrow morning tomorrow morning to close all Hezbollah and Iranian centers in your countries. They are not civilian innocent centers. They are endangering your very security. You will be slaughtered just like us. Unifil, there is a question in Unifil here. Uh, my favorite, uh, you know, I've been dealing, following Unifil for many years. Uh, I think that it's clear to everybody now that there is Hezbollah in South Lebanon and Unifil cannot do anything about it. So my suggestion to those with us today that are uh, having soldiers in Unifil, to pull them out and to make sure that you leave a very small uh, force of Unifil in Lebanon that can uh, moderate uh, tactical incidents, I don't know what, and all the rest, rescue their lives 
and take them out. Because if you won't do that, Hezbollah will use them as human shields. And none of, the, none of us wants that. I see the question again and again and again about escalating ourselves at the Northern Front. And as I've said, I don't know what to hope for. I, I have two um, concerns around that. One is the fact that, again, two front campaign, IDF divided to two fronts campaign, and fire, massive fire on the North as well. It's a challenge for the State of Israel, military challenge and civilian challenge, and we are aware of that. Um, and and second, you know, there is a saying, you know how you start the war, you never know how it's going to end. So we, we should bear that in mind. The second uh, concern is international community. We hardly get legitimacy here when we speak about the South. What do you think, that uh, Hezbollah has military bases that we marked as target? We have plenty of targets of Hezbollah in Lebanon, and most of them are in the civilian infrastructure, in homes, in schools, in mosques, under the, the schools, in the middle of Beirut, inside the most crowded areas of Beirut, inside Hariri Airport, uh, in cemeteries, in churches. Uh, every third home in the Shiite towns of South Lebanon is used for military purposes of Hezbollah. The, Lebanese, the South Lebanese needs to evacuate. Needs to, you know, we are evacuate for our safety. I suggest the Lebanese to evacuate as well if this will escalate as quickly as possible. Because Hezbollah is using the Lebanese as human shields as well. So again, if we will escalate ourselves, what kind of legitimacy will you give us? How are we going to gain that? And eventually, again, eventually there will not be another option. Maybe this will happen, I don't know. But this is a concern. Tons of questions, let's see. Um, Yes, somebody is asking about West Bank. Uh, yes, uh, West Bank, it's another front. It's another active front, uh, not as the South, not as the North, but everybody bear in mind that before all of that started, there were uh, shooting attacks, throwing of stones, Molotov battles, and stabbing in West Bank daily in the past uh, two years, daily. Daily, okay. The the Jews that are living in West Bank were attacked daily, and we have around I don't know the exact number, and now around half a million Jews that are living in West Bank. By the way, you know my grandmother was born in Hebron, which is one of the biggest cities in the West Bank, and she was expelled. All the Jewish community of Hebron was expelled in the massacre of Arabs against Jews in Hebron in 1929. She was seven years old back then. And will the U.S. fleet at least be able to defend the gas rigs? I don't know about Greek or Italian air forces that are willing to assist. I, I have no idea about the gas rig. I believe that U.S. it's already here, as you know, uh, or or on its way to here, uh, is willing to assist uh, us uh, defend. Uh, our uh, major civilian infrastructures, as I've said. Um, don't look for black or white. Here. It's not that, okay, the US is here, everything is okay, and uh, it's war. It's war. There will be damages. We don't know exactly how much, but there will be damages. Yeah. Uh, our president continued to say there is not evidence of Iran's involvement in the planned attack from Hamas. I thought it's all, it was only on the first day. I don't know if you if you continue, I didn't hear that, but uh, tell him to call me. I have tons of evidence. I just presented them to you. I'm not following the US Fifth uh, Fleet. We know that there are two US carriers and more ships uh, on their way to the Mediterranean. Uh, to our area, more than that, I don't know. Uh, 
Uh, if it is known, how many rockets in the hands of Hezbollah? Do we know where they are? Yes, IDF knows where the rockets are. Um, they are spread all over. Hezbollah was working with the tactic of redundancy. It means that they are spread in all the towns, the Shiite towns in South Lebanon, maybe in some of the Christian towns of South Lebanon. Uh, do we know where the launching sites are near the border, far from the border? Launching sites are everywhere, near the border, far from the border, in Beirut, and all over the place. Launching sites doesn't mean that the rockets are there yet, okay? The idea is to have a launching site which can be a parking lot in the middle between houses or apartments or buildings, and the truck with the rockets will just drive out, launch, and go back to the apartment. That's right, not all rigs, gas rigs, I accept the correction. Uh, do you need permission for the US Navy to open fire if anti-ship missile fired at the aircraft? I think this is a very tactical question. I don't have the answer. All I can say that there is a strict coordination between the navies and there is strict coordination between uh, US officers and Israeli officers. And there are people in the army that are strictly responsible for that. And I believe that we don't have to worry ar around that. You know? All the coordinations will be made when we speak of tactical uh, involved, military involvement of the United States in this campaign. Why did Saudi Arabia welcome Iran back into the fold, i.e. open embassy, etc.? Look, this is a very good question. For the Arabs, they don't care to play on both sides, as long as it contributes to their security. They don't have any problem to have the Israeli embassy and in the next week, the Iranian embassy. For, for, from their point of view, that's the safest play, play. Because that way, Israel will join them and they will work together against Iran. And Iran, they uh, preserve an, an open dialogue with, what's wrong with that? They don't share any values either with Israel, nor with Iran. These are not uh, democracies, I mean, okay? Why not Operation Free Palestinians vis-a-vis -vis Operation Iron Swords? Well, I don't choose the wording for the operations, but as I've said, this is not about the Palestinians. I'm sorry. This campaign is not about the Palestinians. This campaign is about a brutal ideology that is taking advantage of the lives of the Palestinians to promote what they want to promote. Um, there is a question here about the hostages. What if the only way to destroy Hamas involves risk of the hostages? I think we are already there. We understand that we are taking the risk here. And we decided to destroy Hamas. If IDF will have specific information uh, about specific area where there are hostages, I believe that it will cease the fire in this specific place. But in general, we need to fight Hamas. Uh, I feel pains when I'm saying that. But, um, this is exactly why Hamas took the hostages, to survive and to repeat the catastrophe in the future. Is Assad considered a threat? Assad uh, or Syria by itself is not a country anymore. Syria is divided between everybody, Kurds, Russians, Iranians, Hezbollah, uh, a little bit of Americans, very, very little and a little bit for the Iranian government itself. So the threat is not Assad himself. The threat is the specific involvement of Iran in Syria, which includes a smuggling of advanced weapons from Iran to Iraq into Syria, whether by flights, and you have seen that a Damascus airport and Aleppo airport were bombed uh, already twice. 
twice only in the past week, probably because this route of smuggling weapons from Iran to Syria. Uh, the, the problem is with the Syrian advanced weapon industry that is now in the hands of Iran and Assad enabled it. And there is also a little bit of a problem with the Syrian army, which it's still building its power after the civil war. But if it will uh, get involved, and I'm sure the Iranian wanted that, but I'm not sure they will get that. It would mean that we'll have another front, maybe not uh, soldiers that are dead professionals, but it will make the IDF busy with another front. Uh, it's stretching uh, the IDF to more areas. And that's why it's a problem, but it's not existing a threat. Everything that exists in Lebanon, all the munitions that I've mentioned, exist in Syria as well. The problem is that uh, we don't know how much. Maybe the, the IDF knows. I don't know what the amount of uh, munitions and missiles exist in Syria. I understand that there were a lot of flights, and again, the smuggling went every day, and Israel was fighting this uh, in the past decade. Let's take two more questions, and we're done. Uh, Does rocket fire from Gaza reach the north? Yes, not where I am. About an hour drive from here to the lower Galilee. Uh, the name is Kiryat Atta, where I left there, and it was intercepted by Davidson. What kind of damage can IDF inflict on Hezbollah? Thank you for the question. Very important question. The destruction in, in Lebanon is not going to be less than the destruction of Israel. It's going to be worse. And again, the player that should be held responsible is Hezbollah and not the state of Israel. Since we know it now, and when they are putting us in such a threat, we are going to defend ourselves. And they are entrenched in the population, in the civilian areas, and they're going to be a brutal damage in Lebanon. And I suggest all Lebanese to leave the war zone the moment it started and maybe earlier than that. The moment they understand that it's going to stop, I'll put it this way, because they would know better than me. Uh, the damage will be brutal, and everywhere there is Hezbollah, there is a risk that Israel will attack. If we will uh, end up in a situation that Hezbollah is threatening all the civilian infrastructure in Israel that I've mentioned, everywhere there is Hezbollah, Israel will attack. Um, Qatar, there are questions here about Qatar, we'll end up with it. Um, <laughs> Qatar is, uh, I, I mentioned the Arabs that the UAE, for example, that are playing on both sides. Qatar is the, I don't know, is the architect of playing on both sides, or playing with all the players. The biggest military base in the Middle East of America is in Qatar. And Qatar, at the same time, supports Hamas. And Qatar, at the same time, uh, is uh, creating negotiations platforms and all these, uh, you know, what you talked about, the, the unfroze money. And Qatar wants to be everywhere. Qatar wants to be a key player in the Middle East. And how it is doing that? By supporting everybody. Iran, Hamas, open channel with Israel, open channel with the United States, supporting the United States, enabling to have its uh, base there. They, they support everybody. What's the problem? Of course it's a problem, yes? But what's the problem? Do they want us to finish Hamas? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't see them uh, stop hosting Hamas in their uh, country. I didn't see the, the I didn't see them, you know, doing something against uh, Hamas, except for, by the way, cutting the budgets to Hamas. But this is not eliminating Hamas. 
Uh, by the way, I believe that the fact that they cut the budgets will also encourage the campaign. But again, it's not the, it's not the re the reason. It's not the reason. I will stop here. Also because you know, again, I didn't sleep too much, and it is uh, becoming also a little bit physically difficult to me, and even psychologically difficult to me. Uh, and I want to say say thank you for all these tons of questions. And I'm sorry if I didn't answer all of these. I encourage you. Uh, to send me questions, uh, especially on my WhatsApp. If you don't have my WhatsApp, send me an email and I will send you recorded answers to all your questions. I encourage everybody to write, to publish according to everything we discussed here. If you need visuals that proves everything I've said, I have tons of them. All of the information is accessible on our website and our YouTube. You can find it in our Twitter. You can find tons of visuals that proves everything I've just said. And if you can't find and you need something specific, you're invited to reach out to us and we will send you everything that you need. Uh, pray for us. Stay safe wherever you are. And thank you for joining us today.